HR issues can kill you. One complaint against your company can turn your world upside down. And you spend way too much time dealing with HR when you should be spending your time on making a profit. You should talk to Bambi. With Bambi, get access to your own dedicated U.S.-based HR manager starting at just $99 per month. They get to know you and your business while providing HR expertise and the personal touch you need and want. They're available by phone, email, and real-time chat, so onboarding and terminations run smoothly. Team members reach peak performance, and your business stays compliant with changing HR regulations. And with Bambi's HR Autopilot, you'll automate important HR practices like setting policies, training, and feedback. HR managers can easily cost 80 grand a year, but Bambi starts at $99 per month. Schedule your free conversation today to see how much Bambi can take off your plate. Go to Bambi.com right now and type in Accelerate under podcast when you sign up. It'll really help the show. Spelled BAM, B-E-E dot com. Bambi.com. Type in Accelerate. Welcome to Accelerate Your Business Growth, where we're exploring all sorts of business topics. Experts from around the world, join me, your host, Diane Helbig, for a conversation where they share their expertise with all of you. Take what you need, when you need it. Featured on Inc.com, Forbes, and MSNBC's Your Business, this podcast is recognized as one of the best podcasts for small business, sales, leadership, social media, and more. When it comes to business, Accelerate Your Business Growth has got it covered. And now on with the show. My guest today is Jessica Lackey. Jessica is a strategy and operations advisor who bridges the gap between traditional business practices and a thirst for creating sustainable businesses with a human-centric approach. With a background in blue-chip corporate leadership, McKinsey & Company Consulting, and a Harvard business degree, Jessica Jessica combines her deep experience to help businesses grow without sacrificing the well-being of their clients, team, and community. Thanks so much for being here today, Jessica. I'm excited to be here. I am thrilled to have you here. So we're we're going to be talking about scaling up. And um, I think I want to start with uh, maybe one of the potential dangers of scaling up, um, which is ways in which it can negatively impact your clients and your community. So is there a cost involved or a potential cost involved? And if so, how do we Uh, make sure we're setting ourselves up so that isn't our experience. Yeah. So have you ever had an experience when you're working with a service provider where um, the marketing was great, but all of the deliverables they promised were late? Um, Things, it took days for questions or weeks for questions to get answered. Um, You never really sure where you felt like you were in the process. That's what can happen when um, service-based businesses scale too fast. The customer Mm. doesn't feel like their needs have been met. I'm not talking about the, um, the needs that are, you know, maybe outside of scope, but really, you know, we have an expectation for how we're going to be served by the people we work with. And, If the communication's poor, the processes aren't great, that can just leave a sour taste in our clients' mouths. And that can happen when organizations scale too quickly and don't have great processes and systems in place. I see. So they sort of get ahead of themselves instead of planning for that growth. They let it happen and then they're like playing cleanup. That's one way it can happen. Exactly. You're playing cleanup with the the client experience. Another way I can happen is uh, you want to scale up, like maybe you're a group coach or a consultant, you want to scale putting more people in programs. Well, what happens if now you lose track of clients? Uh, People don't get the one-on-one attention. You have to add on a 
kind of support coach that maybe isn't trained like you are. And then a client feels like they've been bait and switched. Well, I thought I was going to get this person deeply embedded in my business, but now I'm being given somebody else to work with who maybe doesn't have the, the skill set. That again can happen when we focus on revenue growth and scale versus making sure that we are in integrity with how we're delivering uh, to our clients and what we're selling to our community. I see. That's great. I, I love that, you know, being in integrity with it. So talk to me about um, pricing. So how do we approach pricing to make sure that we're maintaining our integrity, but we're still growing? Yeah, I like to think about the the three levels here. We want to think about integrity to ourselves, integrity to the clients, and also integrity to the community. I keep using these, these three lenses. Pricing, we have to make sure that it's sustainable for us. Um, so at the number of clients that you can serve, again, um, with the, the level of service you desire, with your personal capacity, with your team's capacity, are you pricing in a way that will allow you to thrive in the business? Because that's level number one. Yeah. But then we got to think about the clients. Um, and really, are we charging? Again, this is a different decision for every business owner, but are we charging a investment that will allow the business owner to get some kind of return on that investment? Uh, I think talking about business owners here, it breaks my heart. And again, if members of the listener community have seen this or participate in this, you know, it's, it's everyone's choice for themselves, but so many, I see so many high-end mastermind programs charging like $30,000 for you know four months of work together. And especially if that's geared towards newer business owners, that chance that they're going to be able to make their investment back and profit off that is, is small because, you know, we know that, that not a very, not a high percentage of business owners make it across the kind of six figure, multi six figure threshold. So, is it in integrity with our values to charge that kind of pricing if we're looking at beginning business owners? These are some questions that I hope business owners ask as they are are growing, and then thinking about for the community what are the types of ways we make our work accessible without necessarily making our pricing, again, not in integrity with what we need to thrive as a business owner. Yeah, boy. I mean, it really is. Um, uh, it's such an interesting conversation because it really is something that people need to spend some time with. You know, they really need to think all of those things through or it either doesn't work for them or it doesn't work for their clients or both. I just offered a program um, for the summer and it was geared towards smaller business owners and it's been a rough economic climate out there. Yeah. And I had to really sit with reducing the price of my program because for the individuals I wanted to serve, the price I had kind of gone to the market with, people are like, I truly can't afford this. And so I needed to look at my business finances to say, what can I how can I bridge the gap between what my business needs and what is the truly ability to pay for some of the target I want to serve? Now, I covered a lot of that kind of differential with my one-on-one -on -one work, which is geared towards higher revenue businesses. But these are all the questions that I think to be in integrity with yourself, you need to be having these robust dialogues about kind of the purpose of business and who you're working with and what are your priorities and how you want to show up for your business. And are there situations where you, you can't make those two things meet? I mean, where you just have to say, I'm not able to, you know, uh, create an investment that works for a, a certain community because it, it isn't sustainable for me. This is where I think we get to look at the portfolio of our businesses. Um, I know uh, a lot of practitioners, especially in the diversity, equity, inclusion space, who want to serve a population. Um, they actually have corporate clients or larger organizations that they work with that then creates the bandwidth in the business to do more accessible or pro bono or large group programs for um, 
organization or for you know individuals or those who don't you know can't afford those kind of corporate prices. So I think it's thinking about the portfolio of working your business. What is how do you potentially separate separate out your clients from your community of impact and be thinking about how do I serve those markets in a way that the whole is serving my business needs while the parts are very, very particular to the tar- types of markets you're serving. I see. Yeah, that's great. That That is great. And now let's talk about hiring because that, that's another thing that I think a lot of small uh, business owners and service providers struggle with. It's that at what point do I hire so that I can continue that sort of sustainable growth. This is an area where we also talk about integrity as well. Um, I know that the tendency for a lot of business owners is when it starts to get overwhelming, we're just going to look to hire. But we're not really ready to hire if we don't know exactly what that person is going to do. If we don't have processes to bring them on board, to manage them, Mm -hmm. to... Um, have processes for them to operate in. I think it's it's really challenging when we're asking um, assistants, virtual generalists, essentially, to be putting processes in place that we, the owner, haven't put in because that's how they're going to thrive. Um, so as we as business owners, we have to think about, do I have a process that this person can plug into or am I asking them to create a process for me and am I hiring the right skill set to create processes versus execute processes I've already created. I say it, it's so interesting. You're, you're talking about these things and the thought that keeps coming into my mind is it, it takes a lot of thought, right? You just can't make these decisions on the fly. It does take a lot of thought. And I want to reassure business owners that they don't have to go through this alone. Um, this is, I think, one of the the myths of entrepreneurship is, well, I want to hire, so I'm going to hire a full-time virtual assistant or part-time virtual assistant. The right move may be, I'm going to hire someone who's a process design expert for just a few hours a month to help me think through my, like, basically sit me down, pull the process out of my head, look at it with a critical eye, and then document the process that I can then slot someone into. I think we are always told, well, we need to come up with these processes by ourselves. We need to create the thinking space for ourselves. And that's really hard. But if you're like, I've got a call on the calendar with a business strategist, process expert, who's going to sit me down and evaluate my processes so that I can then bring someone on, that's not necessarily something that everyone thinks they have access to. And that's part of what I want to reassure business owners is that the first step might not be hiring. The first step might be bringing on an expert to craft processes so that you can hire. Yeah, it, it it's that um, we think there's a like a binary choice. I either do this or I do that. When a lot of times there's something in the middle there that that we can do or something we can implement that that's a step in that direction. Right. Oh, I love how you say dis- dismantling the binary because I think we're we're sold these prescriptions uh-huh. for how we do business right. that are rooted in some truth, but that are sanitized for mm-hmm. mass market, um, mass market advice. And so um, it's, it's going, it's having the, the thought that, you know, pricing hiring team members, you do need to evaluate your prices. Um, we may, may be not um, able to take the kind of double your prices type of trope Um literally, but we then say, I am, I need to review my prices on a regular basis. Um, maybe it's not hiring, but it is saying, who do I need to bring on to support me in my business? And um, thinking through what exactly is the help that I need? What's yeah. going to create leverage in my business versus just, I need help. Let me hire someone who can quote unquote, do it all. Right. Right. But then that also you know, you you had said about <clears throat> knowing what it is you need them to do and and setting them up for success. That that also, um, for me, points to having some sort of um, I don't know, not user's manual, but standard operating procedures, some sort of 
handbook expectation sort of thing so that before you hire. So even if you do someone you know, like a VA on a project basis, but having real clarity around this is what the goal is, this is what the expectation is, all of those things. Yeah, well, you got to create the operating manual for your business, but also I would encourage you to create the operating manual for yourself, which yeah. I, might sound like a crazy concept, but um, what kind of leader do you want to be? Um, mm. What are, how do you like to communicate with your team members? Um, where are the quote unquote, I would call them like the administrative pitfalls that are going to stymie any um, one for working with you? Um, I, you know, calendar management, knowing how to process your emails, those sound like really um, very unsexy things. But in order to have anyone supporting you in your business, these are some of the ways you need to think about, do I like to manage my task list every day? Do I like to look at it once a week? Am I not even sure I have projects and task lists? Those are types of things that you have to look at your leadership style and your self-management style to say, what am I truly going to be able to to give up? Where am I going to be able to bring someone on board? And what are the personal kind of like philosophies that I need to want to live by in order to make having a team hiring be successful? So it's the, how does the business work? But like, how does my life work that um, may indicate the the type of support that you you will be able to use in your business? Absolutely. I was just having this conversation yesterday with someone and Um, because one of the things that she mentioned that I think a lot of small business owners struggle with is um, giving up that control, feeling like it it makes them vulnerable. uh, You know, whoever I get is not going to do it as well as I do or, you know, whatever that philosophy or that, that mindset is. But you can't grow if you're the one doing everything. Exactly. And it's so important to think about well, they don't do it as well as I do, but where does that matter in your business? Um, does it matter when you're scheduling meetings, when you're responding to scheduling inquiries, or does it really matter when we're talking about crafting your message, creating your marketing, really building rapport with your clients? Where does the, you know, they won't do it as well as I do. Where does that, where is that truly critical that you are in charge and really setting the standards? And where is that less critical? Um, those are, you know, I've, I see too many people try to like outsource their social media and their marketing without having an impeccable message, without having an impeccable brand voice and brand guidelines. And then they're frustrated because their social media person isn't capturing their voice. And I'm like, well, how can they, we don't have (laughs) clear offers, clear content, clear message pillars. So of course, when you do it, it is more seamless. And if that message is evolving still, and those offers are still evolving, and you're still not totally sure what you want to put put in out in the world. I don't. It may not make sense to bring on a social media team because neither of you are going to be happy. Right. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It, it's a lot of um, being true to yourself and, and truthful with yourself in there. Exactly. Welcome to Don't Retire, Graduate, the podcast that asks you what you want to be when you grow up so you can graduate into retirement with a purpose and a passion, whether you're 25, 85, or any age in between. Gain actionable financial and mindset tips from your favorite authors, podcasters, and influencers to help you reach that exciting next chapter. Listen now and start building your path to financial freedom and reframing what retirement can mean to you. This is your host, Eric Brotman, reminding you, don't retire, graduate. Hey friends, this is Jim Knight, former 21-year Hard Rock executive turned best-selling author and top 10 keynote speaker. And I'm Brant Menzoir, former frontman of Hollywood's most dangerous band turned top 10 motivational speaker and best-selling author. We host the how-to podcast, Thoughts That Rock, where we talk to rock stars, athletes, CEOs, astronauts, and even next door neighbors who share their expertise and opinions. Together, we tackle the most interesting and challenging topics of today. Whether you want to learn how to become more confident, how to deal with anxiety at work, or how to write a hit song, or use Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu in life, we've got hundreds of episodes to help amp up your life and move you forward. 
Subscribe to Thoughts That Rock wherever you listen to podcasts and check out evergreenpodcast.com for more information. So what's your experience been working within uh, so-called profit at all costs business cultures? I have been part of profit at all costs business cultures in the corporate space, but I've also seen it in the um, online, the service-based business online space. So in corporate, man, right now, like you're seeing layoffs happening. Um, You're seeing incredibly poor management. People are mandating, you must come back to the office regardless of whether or not that's actually um, supportive of the individual. Um, Spoiler alert, we know that um, it's, much more impactful for women than it is for men to have to go back into the office. But that's because they never sat down and decided their priorities, their management style, set up ways to manage a remote team. So you know, mm. if if anyone's gone through a layoff and they're like, well, I had two jobs and now I have five jobs <laughs> and they'll never let me hire again, but they did a huge cash buyback of stock. So balance sheet's sitting really pretty but yet I have five jobs. That's a part of the profit at all cost mentality in the kind of corporate space. And in the online space, um, you see this where um, individuals enroll too many people in their programs. People don't get what was promised. They're, I've, I mean, I've seen the the drama on Instagram with some of these coaches promising offers and never delivering. Ooh. And You know, or you see the NDA clauses, um, not NDAs, the non-disparagement clauses of some of the kind of bigger business building programs that there's, that's why there's no negative reviews because you put a negative review up and they're going to go, you know, have their legal team tell you to take it down. That strikes me as a profit at all cost mentality because there's no way to really see what are the real results from these programs so you as a consumer can make a fair investment choice. Right. Huh. That's interesting. Eek. Or, you know, this profit at all costs means that you're um, giving your overworked team 24 hours of notice before changing an entire marketing campaign. It's always on a fire drill. It's always on a short-term mm-hmm. notice instead of staffing the team up and taking potentially more time to make decisions so that everyone's marching to the same tune, spending more of your time doing the management and leadership. Um, It's um, rapid fire changes that fall on the burden of your team. That's another profit at all cost mentality in the online business space. Yeah. And it just is not sustainable at all because so many things suffer. It's not just one thing. it's, It's like a house of cards. It's such a house of cards and it looks pretty and shiny on the outside. And then when you look at the under the hood of the business, the foundations aren't there. And again, this goes back again to that question of what are your principles and what are your values as a business owner? And how do you want to treat your team? How do you want to treat your clients? How do you want to treat the environment in which you you work in? Um, These are all, again, like these are not things that you can get from a playbook telling you how to build your business, those are these are deeply personal questions to consider as you're looking at the next stage of growth. How are we thinking about right-sized business versus a always growing business? Because mm. um, kind of getting to the next level of growth might mean changing some of those, you know, I see this in my a lot of my clients. I've or a couple of them don't want to manage people. And I'm like, that's cool. That's great. Let's design a business where you're not having to do a lot of people management, but you're still getting your needs covered. Right. Right. Yeah. It's putting all that out there and, and getting it all set. And I, I do wonder about something else. And that is um, the sales experience. I, I don't. I don't want to say against. I'll say toward. I guess um, the client experience and matching those two things up because this is a lot of what you're talking about. That you know you sell this thing, but then that's not what the client experiences. So, how does a, a business leader make sure they're matching those things up? We want to think about 
what it is we are selling to our clients. Are we selling a bespoke intimate experience? Are we positioning ourselves as, as, a, as, a, as a leader, as a coach or a teacher or a kind of thought leader? Um, because if you're positioning yourself as a coach and yet in the container, that's a coaching container, um, maybe you get to ask a question to, you know, to the leader. That's not really coaching, right? That's yeah. advice giving. That's that's teaching. I don't think that model is bad, but I think we have to set the expectation of what's the kind of what's the engagement with the brand, what's the engagement with the leader of the org of the of the container, and how much access do you get, and how much access was promised and sold. Um, I think there are so many um, business owners, businesses that are selling like a process which is great. That can be taught. And so many business owners that are selling access, which if there's a thousand people in a program, there's very little access. So how are we matching the, what we're selling to what the client experience is going to be? And how are we aligning that with the price? Um, and again, like we'd like all three of those pillars to match up. So the client feels, yes, this was a worthwhile investment. I got what I paid for. I got the results. Maybe not the, you can't never, you can never promise results, but you right. can promise that you'll deliver and what they, what they expect to receive. Is there, how do I want to ask this question? Um, so, uh, boy, this is, this is, I, I have it rolling around in my head. So one of the things that I find with super service providers is they, um, the way that they set their prices feels like it's more based around what they want to make as opposed to the value of whatever it is they're providing. So it, it, is there any sort of I don't know, guideline or, you know, question and answer sort of thing that someone can do to make sure that they're living in um, some sort of word or world of reality, <laughs> for lack yeah, of a I better think, word. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, business owners can, again, charge what they want. Like they can, I mean, the market, they'll, they'll be able to charge what the market can bear. So, you know, that that is what we see from many companies that are concerned with like top line revenue. Um, but as a client, then you should be asking the question, um, what's the what's the likelihood that I will make my investment back? Or what is it costing me to not have this problem solved? Or how big of a percentage of my um, revenue is this? Um, and is this something that I can cash flow in my business? Uh, I think it's a little different when we're selling um, things like that aren't that aren't business expenses. Um, but those are some of the questions that I would ask as a consumer and as a business owner. I'm saying, you know, does is my are my clients looking at the what they're you know what they're work, spending working with me and to say, yeah, if I'm spending X amount with um, with Jessica a month. What's the likelihood that I'm going to make that investment back 2x, 3x it back? Because as a business provider, you want to say, yeah, I I feel confident that this investment will return um, as long as we we do work together. But again, not every business owner thinks like that, but that's how I think about it as a consumer to say, what's the likelihood I'm going to make my money back on this? Right. And is this a um, is this a teach, is this a skill that I'm missing right now? Um, so I have a budget as a consumer for um, classes I take and coaching I go through and service providers that I work with. And I'm always evaluating to say, um, you know, am I, is this getting me more revenue? Is this truly freeing up my time or is this just money I'm spending? Right. And I like to not do number three. <laughs> <laughs> that one is not so good. <laughs> But it's alluring, you know. We, oh, sure. We, you know, I, like at some point, at some point, I um, hired a, I bought like podcast pitching templates. I'm like, I'm gonna pitch myself on podcasts, and you know what? I never, 
did anything with the templates. I actually needed to hire a higher price service to help me curate it and customize it. Those are the types of things that say, um, how do I stop accumulating stuff and start making real strategic choices and in the investments I make in my business? Yeah, that that's a biggie. It is because, and, and I think part of the reason I know for me is because sometimes the price point's so low that you just say, oh, you know what, I, I'll buy it and then I'll work it. And then you don't work it. And you don't work it. Yeah, yeah. that's that that falls into number three of like, yes. Um, you know, that's great for business owners, but then we have to think about actually, do I want to continue selling something that yes, makes money, but like that people aren't getting results from that's a, again, a decision that the business owner needs to make about like, what are they selling and who are they selling it to? And what's the container in which they want to sell it knowing that, um, you know, how do you capitalize on potentially money in the marketplace without saying, well, if no one's really doing this, is this something I really want to sell? Right. Those are, but those are, those would be questions for you as a business owner that no one can answer for you, but that should be considered part of your, um, considered part of your, your financial and strategic planning about how you want to show up in the market. Yeah. Right. Right. And it gets back to that integrity part. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. This is great, Jessica. I, I really appreciate this. Um, Will you share with the listeners how they can find you and anything you think they should know? Yeah, um, you can find me at jessicalackey.com backslash welcome. I send out a newsletter every week talking about how we do business radically differently. And uh, you'll also see a link to uh, how I work with business owners to really set their values for how they want to grow their right size business. Excellent. Thank you. It's really, it's, it's great information. I think it's, uh, for me, listening to you, it feels liberating because it has such a focus that then it's, it doesn't really feel like um, I I can be all over the place. You know, it feels like it helps keep someone centered. There's so much marketing out there designed to make us feel like we need to go faster, <laughs> grow more, do more. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, good. I don't know what happened. My Zoom went out. I'll have to edit this part of it. So you were saying there's so much marketing okay. out there. Go back to that, please. Yeah, there's yeah, there's so much marketing that tells us we need to grow more, do more, be more, and that we there's no time for rest and that we just have to keep you know hustling our way to more. And I love that fact that you said liberating because I'd like there to be more messaging about stabilizing, being sustainable. Oh, yeah. Poo, I'll start again. All right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not a lot. Sorry. Um, that's okay. Um, there is so much marketing out there that says you have to do more, be more, grow more, faster, better, stronger. And I'd like there to be some countervailing wisdom that says be sustainable, be an integrity, be profitable, and be easeful. And that may mean taking a break from growth for a while as you get systems and processes and orders, or maybe saying, I'm in a sweet spot with the amount of marketing I like to do, the amount of clients I have, the size of team I have, and I'm just going to sustain here. And that's not something that's normally celebrated. So I yeah. love that you said that this is liberating because scaling to the next level may not be the right move for business owners at any stage of business. And how do we normalize that sustaining is not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of strength. Right. Absolutely. I, I'm, uh, uh, that was beautifully said. Thank you for that. That, that was terrific. So um, thank you. I so appreciate you being here uh, and sharing this information and listeners. Thank you. You are who we're doing this for. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Accelerate Your Business Growth, a production of Evergreen Podcasts. Discover more episodes of this podcast and explore others 
at evergreenpodcast.com. As always, continue to prosper and be curious. And if you're looking to get your sales strategy headed in the right direction, pick up a copy of Succeed Without Selling on Amazon or wherever books are sold. Until we meet again on another episode of Accelerate Your Business Growth, goodbye and good day. The Jim Stroud Podcast explores the discoveries and trends forming the future of our lives. Brain-to-brain communication, robot bosses, microchip implants for workers, and artificial intelligence replacing human workers are all happening now. If you want to know what's happening next, subscribe now to the Jim Stroud Podcast.